Thank you. Please be seated. And some of you today discovered for the first time that Pablo plays jazz. <laughs> and then I had to smile because Noel, Papa paid, played bass, right? <laughs> Papa played bass. All right. So today's scripture lesson comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Hear this good news. One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, which is the same as the Sea of Galilee, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put him out a little from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep water and let down the nets for a catch. And Simon answered, um, <clears throat> Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in, other boat, in, an, in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. I've been to the Sea of Galilee, and it literally sits in a bowl. There are hills all around it. And so for Jesus to sit in the boat and be just off the shore on the water became a natural amphitheater. His voice would bounce off the water and also the hills behind where the people were listening. And he had a captive audience, and he continued to teach them. And while he was doing so, one of the boat, the boat that he was in belonged to Simon Peter and his fishing crew. And he asked Simon just to push them off the shore just a wee bit. And so as he taught, Simon and his crew were cleaning their nets. They had been fishing all night long, and it was bad. Now, when I was a boy and I would be told that on Saturday morning I was going fishing with my father, I never understood why we had to get up at 4 a.m. Why would fish be hungry at 4 a.m.? But Simon and his crew had been fishing all night, and they caught nothing. Now, these were not recreational fishermen. This is what they did to make their living. So it would be like you having a storefront, and you worked all day long, and not one customer came in and bought anything. What was the problem? Well, Herod Antipas discovered that the Romans loved fish oil and salted fish. So he moved a super Walmart fishing company right there in the Sea of Galilee area. And then he started commercial fishing, which dried up all the small businesses. So when the small business fishermen were not catching anything, that also meant the markets were not selling anything. And it affected the whole economy. Just like it does now when a super Walmart moves outside of a small town and all the in-town shops dry up and go out of business. So I would imagine that Simon and his crew, as they were cleaning their nets, were thinking, how are we going to feed our family this week? And just about the time they had finished cleaning their nets, Jesus had finished teaching. Jesus walked up to him and said, hey, why don't you go back out and cast your nets into the deep. Imagine how that would have felt at the moment. Up all night, fishing, caught nothing, stressed, tired, just finished the nets, 
ready to go home, get some sleep, and try again tomorrow. And at first, Simon resists. But something in him made him say, Master, we've worked hard all night, and we haven't caught anything. But because you say it, we will do it. We'll go out and cast our nets once again. We will let down our nets into the deep. And they did so. And the hall was so large that the nets were breaking. The hall of fish was so large that one boat could not handle it. In fact, two boats came in to put all the fish that they were, had gathered. And both boats were starting to, 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 to sink because of the weight of fish. This is like winning the lotto when you're about to get foreclosed on your house, right? You know what this means? You have that much fish, it means your family is going to eat another week. That means the markets are going to be able to feed their families and the, and the people who make the bread and all the other businesses that are connected to fishing. See? Simon and his crew have finally hit the lotto. And what was Simon's response? Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. Simon recognized something miraculous had taken place. And while he was in the presence of a beautiful human being like Jesus, Simon saw all of his flaws all at once. Go away, Lord, for I am a sinful man. The word sin coming from the Greek word hamartia means missing the mark. It seems to be a part of human nature that we encounter the divine in whatever way it reveals itself. That because we see ourselves from a place of shame, we want to push the divine away because we're afraid that, oh my God, if God really sees who I am, God will punish me or God will shame me, or God will cast me out. When the opposite is true, the absolute opposite is true. For I believe that when we are at a place of that kind of honesty and self-awareness, we are most vulnerable. Our guards are down. The fortress walls that we have built around ourselves have all crumbled. And there we are standing naked before God. And what happens? God celebrates. Because now, in this moment of vulnerability, we are most teachable. Over the years, I've done a lot of counseling. And there are times that I see people in this congregation over the years that I see them crying every week after we're going out. And I can just sense they're hurting. And I will just share with them, you know, I have a gift of healing wounded souls. Come see me. Let's talk about it. And they will resist for a long time. Finally, the day will come. I said, Pastor, I need to come and see you. Great, come on in. And they'll sit down and say, my whole world is falling apart. And I say, wonderful. And then they look at me like, what? <laughs> wonderful. I'm glad your whole world is falling apart. Because now you're realizing that all you've tried to do to keep everything together is not working. And now you're open to learn something new. Wonderful. And without fail, every time, Pastor, I resisted coming to talk to you because when I tell you what I'm going to tell you, I'm afraid you're going to be ashamed of me. 
And that's when I reassure them this. First of all, there's nothing you can say to me that's going to make me feel that way about you. Then I share my own story about how when I shared my most darkest, deepest, most horrible secrets to strangers, did not sleep the night before, thinking when I say what I'm going to say to this group, they will probably throw rocks at me or when they see me coming, they'll walk on the other side. But what happened was just the opposite. It's because you told us this. We can trust you. And we love you. And so I share that story with them. I say, I've done this. And it was the beginning of a miraculous journey. So let's go. Let's go. Now we can start experiencing some healing. And I imagine this is what Peter experienced, Simon. Is at that moment when he was most vulnerable, he let Jesus in. And his life was never, his life was never the same. In fact, it was such a, a huge, huge impact upon his life that Simon left his business behind and walked away from it. So what can this beautiful, powerful story teach us about our spiritual journey? First of all, there is a call. There is a calling. And God's the one who initiates the calling. And when God calls us, it doesn't mean that everyone that God calls does pastoral ministry or music ministry or, you know, children and youth that, No. If you're a person who's highly skilled at, at helping people to create budgets, your calling may be to, have, to be able to help people who live from week to week to, to create a budget so that they can reduce stress in their life. Or you might be someone who's a computer whiz and you can create a, a web page for a church or a group of people or a charity that makes it easier for them to get access to more people and for people to not. The calling can be anything. You have a calling, yes. I, want, I am concerned that there are poor people. I want to feed poor people. I have a concern for the LGBT community that's being neglected. I will reach out to no matter what your job is, you're going to do whatever you can to bring comfort and healing to those people. That's the calling. I was always sensitive to the, to the presence of God growing up. And one thing I can share with you is that never in my life did I not know the song, Jesus Loves Me, This I Know, for the Bible Tells Me song. I have no memory of not knowing that song. I had given my heart to Jesus and my soul to Jesus, got baptized, did all the things that I needed to do. And I don't know how old I was, 19, 20 years old, I think. And I was at a youth event where there were three guys playing guitars. And at the end of their concert, each of them had written their testimony and put it to music. I don't know why it moved me like it did. I don't remember who the three guys are, were. I don't remember the songs they sang, but I remember in that tradition when they called to come forward and give your life to Christ, I felt the urge to do so. And at that moment in time, I ask this question. God, I know I've already given my heart to Jesus. Are you calling me to ministry? And it was as though a, a rush of, of feelings and, and energy just went from my head to every extremity of my body. And oh, how I regretted asking that question at that moment of time. It was a calling. Over the years, I've pulled away from church. My former tradition in 1989, I realized I could no longer serve in this denomination. It, it goes against everything that I am as a human being. And then, when I thought, what am I going to do now? A voice in my head as clear as a bell ringing, ding, I called you to be a minister. Not a specific denominational minister. I continued. I was so disillusioned by church. I got out of it altogether. I'm done. 
In 1992, I quit. I thought, you know what? I'm good at counseling. I want a career in counseling. And during 10 months of being unemployed, I finally got that opportunity. But something else happened during those 10 months. I needed money, and I discovered there was a UCC church in the area that needed someone to preach for them when their minister wasn't there. This particular minister would leave and do all of six weeks of his leave time at once. That was $600. I'm in. But I made a discovery. Even though I went there to go do a job to get some money, they heard me like I had never been heard before. You know how powerful that is? To have a voice and you share your voice, but you feel like you're speaking to the, to the walls and the ceilings and the floors. I was preaching the same things that I'd always preached because I didn't create a brand new sermon. Why would I do that, right? Pull out of the old, out of the old bin there. Okay, yeah, this one is, I have my, I actually, I did. Before the computer, I had a file with my all-star sermons, right? There were about 10. <laughs> I was being heard. I eventually did get into the counseling. The Center for Drug-Free Living, which is now known as Aspire. I was the men's aftercare counselor. While I was doing that, I came upon the church in southwest Orange County called Windermere Union Church. And I supplied preached. They asked me if I would like to be a candidate because they were in the interim period. No, I've just started this career. I want to go forward with it. They asked me a second time. I appreciate it. No. And as the time went by, I started becoming disillusioned with the counseling gig. It was boring. I discovered I like wearing 20 hats. <laughs> Going to the same place, doing the same thing every day was boring for me. And then there was another calling. And it came in the voice of Jenny Perinsky. Back in the day when you had regular phones, you know, and answer machines. She called. I listened to the message. Hello, Barton. This is Jenny. Nothing in particular. Just wondering how you're doing. And a voice in my head, as clear as a bell, said, This is the third time. Maybe I should listen. And I started my ministry here in July of 1995, almost 27 years ago. Now, what is ironic is during this time I was at the Center for Drug-Free Living, it was the perfect place for me to be because I learned incredible skills to help me to be a healthier human being. I learned incredible skills that, that provided me the, the tools I needed to be a more effective minister. And on the day that I was, went to the office to resign, because I was taking this gig in July, I said, Ken, I have to talk to you. He says, well, first I need to talk to you. I said, oh, okay. He says, we have had so much success with our aftercare pro uh, program that the Center for Drug-Free Living has decided they're going to move it someplace else and try and start over. So, oh, he says, unfortunately, you no longer have a job as a men's aftercare counselor, but we, have a, we can put you someplace else. You have seniority. We can let somebody else go. I said, well, as it happens. And Ken Allison, looked at me and he says, you know, it's as though God put us together for two years for us to learn from each other and move on. And I started here. It was a calling. It's an invitation. Another thing that the story teaches us that if we're going to understand who we truly are, you've got to cast your nets into the deep into the deep waters. Superficial waters don't work. If you want to go on the spiritual journey, if you want to get experience the fullness of what it means to be a, a human being created in the image of God with God's spirit inside of you, you're not going to do it on the side of a bank with a little bobber, you know? You fish like that before, you just watch that stupid thing for hours and then you turn away, you get distracted and that's when it goes under, right? You can tell my fishing experiences have not been particularly pleasant. I don't fish, by the way. <laughs> but you have to drop into the deep. 
It's a deep inward journey. And when we do this, we find a reality check. You know what I mean by that? It happened to Peter, right? All of a sudden, he saw himself for who he felt he really was. Go away, Jesus, for I am a sinful man. When we go and do that deep work, when we go on that journey of discovery, we discover who we are or who we believe we are. We discover those things about our persona that are toxic and that are destructive, not only to ourselves, but others. And as we go into that deep place, that deep place of the soul, we start to have a clearer picture of who we are. And one or two things will happen at that point. I have found in my own counseling experience and as I've counseled others. You'll walk away thinking, I'm good. Or you'll go deeper. For me, it's like discovering that there's something wrong in your body. And you go to the doctor and for weeks you have all of these tests and they say, you have cancer. At that point in time, most of us will go ahead and accept the treatment that we're about to receive because we're willing to do anything and go through anything to get well. It's the same for your soul work. If you've got a wounded soul, if you've got a broken spirit, you have to do whatever it takes to bring healing and mending and life back to that spirit. And the only way that you're going to know that is going into that deep place. Every time I've counseled an individual who was willing to go to that place, when we came to that crossroad, that fork in the road, whatever proverb you want to use, there's hesitation. Why? Same answer every time. I'm afraid of what I might discover if I go there. I'm afraid. It's scary. And I can tell you from my own experience, and as I have counseled others, that all of us who went to that place made an incredible discovery. For me, I discovered two things. I discovered God. In that deep, dark place in my soul. And I discovered the God described in the story of the prodigal son. That God had been waiting for me to come to that place for a long, long time. Standing on the front porch looking to see if I was coming down the road. And when I came to that place, I discovered the beautiful grace and the love of the divine as it embraced me. I also discovered my truest self, my most glorious self. And for the rest of my life, I've been doing all I can to live into that self. See, When we cast into the deep, we discover the bounty of what it means to be a human being, to be a conscious, enlightened, powerful, glorious human being and you can I believe you can only do that if you're willing to cast deep into the waters of your soul the last thing that this journey teaches us is this God calls us to cast into the deep for a reason so that we can become whole the Greek word for salvation is sozo which means to be made whole, to be made complete, to be liberated. That's the purpose of going on that journey, so that we can be made whole and complete. We do not have to live the wounds and the brokenness. You see. But there's another reason for it. We are become whole for our salvation in order to help others to do the same. For Jesus told Peter, 
from now on, you'll be fishers of people. And this is what I believe, that as each and every one of us take that journey, as we each and every one of us cast into the deep, as each and every one of us take the risk and have the courage to discover who we are at the core of our soul, that it brings healing and wholeness to us, but it also enables us to become healers of others who are on the same journey. Yeah. Healers of one another. Twenty-seven years ago, when I came here, I was still pretty broken. But you brought healing to my soul. 27 years ago, you were the first congregation or group of people in my entire life who accepted me for who I was and did not try to mold me or make me into something you needed me to be. And while you were healing me, I was healing you. And you are healing each other. So yes, the heavens open up from this place. The spirit of love and courage and grace and mercy and the power of acceptance are abundant in this oasis of humanity. God calls us to cast into the deep so that we can become whole. God calls us to cast into the deep so we can help each other to do the same. Thank you. For being the beautiful human beings you are. Thus ends the lesson. Amen.